very much for these kind remarks and everything was said. I had a problem now. Um, so yes, I'm after a bit longer tour in the States. Uh, it's going to end tomorrow to speak a little bit of my experience in Haiti. And I must say that it's symbolic in my eyes to finish the tour here, almost going home. But this is really almost my second home after not only two years in Toronto, but just as Dr. Goldman mentioned, at least once a year I'm here back in Toronto and I really thank all the audience and many friends that are here in the audience for coming. So I would like in this uh, presentation, uh, it's going to take about 25, 30 minutes, to share some of our uh, experiences. Um, there's going to be three short video clips on the way. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, pictures that our group have uh, made during this uh, time that we were there. So we will start with two photos of Charlotte Tzedek. Charlotte Tzedek in 1902. When it was started, still the cameras were around, and the facility which I'm working in now uh, started in 1984. So from Sharet Sedek to the mission to Haiti, we were four physicians, four people, I'm sorry. Gali Wai sitting in the middle, she's the, standing in the middle, she's the chief nurse of Sharet Sedek. She was the chief nurse of the mission to Haiti. Uh, Udi Leber with the right to red shirt, I'm sorry. Uh, orthopedic surgeon, Doron Goldberg, OBGYN, and myself. So I will start with uh, a little bit of background about Haiti. I'm sure most of you know uh, the details. So this is the island of Haiti. Um, it's a little bit south of uh, Miami, Port-au-Prince. The capital has three million people. A total of nine million people live in Haiti in total. And I think one of the most important things that I'm sure all of you know is that Haiti is the poorest country in uh, the Western Hemisphere. This has a lot to do when the earthquake, such a massive earthquake happens in a place like this. Now this is a, what you're gonna see is the US Embassy cameras, the video cameras in the US Embassy in Port-au-Prince. So this is one of the cameras. Look what is seen at January 12th at 5 p.m. So this is what, a short video clip from this camera. This is a camera that is going on all the time. So. Uh, seven on the uh, scale of uh, earthquake took place here. And it's gonna be about uh, 25, 30 seconds this earthquake is, is taking place. And I want the audience to try and look at the back side of this video clip. Look at the houses that you can see in the background now. Look what happens after 25, 30 seconds of earthquake. And we're gonna see the houses starting to collapse now. So this was sent relatively quickly a delegation over there and you're going to see pictures that we were seeing as we arrived there about three days later. So these were taken by our group of people. So about three million people were affected. 230 people died. And even more important is this number, that about 300,000 people were injured. So just try to imagine the magnitude of this uh, disaster, of the chaos that is going around. So in such a poor country, more than one million people, which before a lot of people were homeless, more than one million people turned to be homeless after this uh, massive event. So just a few more pictures that we were taking two or three days after we arrived. So another very short video clip. This is taken from the CNN. Maybe some of you have seen it, but another 20 seconds of the short video clip. They're desperately looking for a place to get this young man to have surgery because he needs much more than what they can do here. So we uh, let Dr. Boost our satellite phone so that he can try to call some people, calling anyone he can think of to get to a more sophisticated hospital. If you don't get him to a better hospital tonight, right. what's going to happen to him? He would die. Families are obviously going to be upset. They've been sitting here with their loved ones who they were so excited to see alive, only now to watch them by a slow, painful death from their rotting flesh because the infections are out of control and they need surgery. I've been here since Thursday. No one except the Israeli hospital has taken any of our patients. I'm just amazed. I'm just amazed at what's here. This is, this is like another world compared to the other hospital. Imaging department. I mean, imaging. My God, they have machines here. They have actual operating rooms, and 
It's just amazing. So the worst cases are finally being moved. So it's always nice to start with a video clip of the CNN that gives a lot of credit to our group. <laughs> so, a little bit about the numbers that we treated. The hospital was operating for 10 days. During these 10 days, we uh, treated just a little over 1,100 uh, patients. We did uh, 242 operations. Really, most of them were life-saving uh, uh, operations. 16 babies were born, and unfortunately, 17 people died. So Pesach is approaching, so Mark is what, what made us, uh, our group different than the other facilities was, that was working there? And for sure, we're not the only ones on ground, there are many other groups. So in the first part of my talk, I will try to point out different reasons that I think made us, our group uh, different. So the first thing is the time frame. Israel responded very quickly, in less than 48 hours, uh, delegation from the IDF left Israel was a delegation of 230 people, 109 from the Home Front Command. So these are rescue people, the security people, the logistic people, and 121 people from the medical corps unit. So the time frame, look at the time frame here. The earthquake took place in Israel midnight between Tuesday to Wednesday. So Wednesday morning by 7 o'clock I'm starting to get phone calls from the IDF, from my unit in the IDF. And by Friday, early morning, we left already Israel. So we left with two planes. One was a passenger plane and the other one was a cargo plane. We were leaving very early Friday morning. We arrived in Haiti. The passenger plane arrived in Haiti noon time, a little bit after noon, Friday afternoon. The cargo plane, which is a heavier plane, had to stop to refuel. It's a long flight. It's a 16-hour flight, so it had to stop to refuel. So this cargo plane arrived in Port-au-Prince about 1 o'clock at night, and by 4 o'clock in the morning, the equipment is arriving to the area where we assembled our hospital. That was at 4 o'clock in the morning. By 10 o'clock, we were already treating patients. So to summarize this, all in all, it took just a little over three days since the earthquake till we were already, in fact, treating patients. So Tfilat Aderich on the way, as we are leaving Israel, and the El Al plane lands in Port of Prince. Four o'clock in the morning, the equipment arrives, and we are starting to put our facilities, and as dawn is coming, we can put up this sign of uh, the medical hospital that is around. We were figure, trying to figure out in Israel how will patients know where we are. There's no good way to spread the word, but for some unknown reason, the word was spread around very quickly. So this is a young girl coming at 10 o'clock already to our facility. Every patient found his own way there. So this girl, someone had to take a door off in order to carry her to our hospital. So they were carried by doors. They were in wheelbarrows, as you see in the, the lower right side, on stretchers, on the hands of their parents. Every car turned into an ambulance. Of course, you can't expect to find any ambulance in Haiti and port au -Prince at this time. So the first reason was the time frame. You have to understand the essence of time in a situation like this. When 300,000 people are injured, Every day, I'm sorry to say, even every minute, people would die because of lack of medical attention. So this is a situation you have to respond quickly. The second thing is that we, as I said, we were, of course we were not the only group there, but we were the only group, at least in the first week, that came with a multidisciplinary hospital. We came with the different wards that a regular hospital will have. We have a surgical wing and an internal wing. I was not the chief of the hospital itself. I, commander of the IVDF Field Hospital, I'll speak about it in a minute, but the medical delegation was not held by myself. I was responsible for the surgical wing. So this is including the operating room, the intensive care unit, the orthopedic, the surgery, and the triage as well. I'll speak a little bit later about the triage. And we had an internal wing headed by one of the emergency room uh, chiefs in Israel, in Be'er Sheva, which had the internal epigratic department. So look at our facility. This, is a, this was taken uh, by a chopper two days after we arrived at this uh, photo. So the blue tents are the ones that we were sleeping, the ones in the middle. Uh, and you can see this is the facility where we are working inside. So look at the different 